Thank you, Janet, for a very generous introduction. Thank you, everyone, for coming. In, in July 1882, at an auditorium probably similar to this one, uh, that was full as well, Dr. Edwin Lewis delivered the commencement speech at the graduation of the students from the Protestant College of Beirut. This Protestant College of Beirut would soon become, actually a couple of decades after that, would become the American University in Beirut. The title of his lecture was Science, Knowledge, and Wisdom. It was received very well by the students and most of the attendees. However, it started a controversy and he was forced to resign soon after. <laughs> I, I am not going to replicate his lecture. <laughs> the objections raised to Dr. Lewis's lecture in the uh, Protestant, Syrian Protestant College in Beirut were related to ideas about, or to the perception of the administration, that the lecture had a very strong Darwinist views. The college was established by the American Board, by the American board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions, a missionary body that established a number of important missions, Protestant missions across the world. The idea, the, Dar the Darwinist views in the speech became problematic to the administration in Beirut and also to the higher authorities of the commission in the United States. We will come to the discussion of the question of Darwinism later on, but the discussion about this particular speech led to a number of other important questions mainly the issue of the presence of science education in the missionary project in general. How much should we dedicate of our time, of our money and our finances to the teaching and the education of sciences in different missionary colleges around the world? This question, which has to do with the relationship between this type of education and the missionary program in its different incarnation, was not entirely new. Science and science education, education of modern science, has been always part and parcel of the missionary message throughout the world. We can mention, for example, a very old instance or iteration of this missionary project in the work of Matteo Ricci, who led one of the first and the most successful Jesuit missions to China in the, end, in the beginning of the 17th century. Ricci had in mind clearly a view that you should be able and you should strive to teaching modern science to the locals because to teach modern science to these natives you're going to change the way they view the world. Christian belief in his opinion and also in the opinion of the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions afterwards was directly connected to the views of modern science. If the natives start to learn these modern sciences, they will also start to embrace the rational and reasonable belief of Christianity. The notion and the ideas that they had is related to a larger perception of structure of knowledge that they believed in. Religious beliefs on one hand and the scientific production of this modern period in time were not seen as completely separate. In fact, they were seen as depending on a similar and the same structure of knowledge and the same ethics of knowing. The structure of this or this epistemic system or epistemic structure is the subject of our discussion today. Not at this particular instance in history, but rather the way we can understand and dissect a particular epistemic system or a particular regime of knowledge, if you will. The construction of a particular system of knowledge or a regime of knowledge involves a number of very important and dynamic processes. Some of these processes include, for instance, the identification of the knower. Who should know? Who is able to acquire this particular form of knowledge? It also involves a discussion of the methods and the different ways of knowing how can we know. And also it includes a delineation of what is important to know or the objects of this epistemic process, what is to be known and what should we know. In the discussion of the knower or who should know, a number of issues are at stake. 
We're thinking about here, or we're considering a number of set of behaviors, of attitudes, of mental habits, of habits of learning that constitutes the individual that becomes the knower or the subject of knowledge. This, in the making of the knower, a very diverse set of considerations become important. We have racial issues at stake, for example. We have issues of gender and sexuality. We have different ways of behavior. We have social customs, religious views, all these issues that come to define the individual at any particular moment in time. In the examples that I mentioned in the beginning, in the Syrian College of Beirut, for instance, the idea again was to create a new knower, that this new field of knowledge requires, demands, and will force the creation of a new knower who will adopt a different set of views and ideas, including the Protestant belief. The graduates of this school, some of them like Yaqub Sarouf or Faris Nimr, and other people who started some of the most important journals, scientific journals in the Middle East in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, shared some of these beliefs. They also thought that it is important not only to teach the new findings of the science, but also to teach a new way of thinking. How to think in a particular manner and how to act in a specific way. For instance, when we think about the program of collecting plants and samples of plants from around the world that was run in many instances and in, many, and in different ways by the Imperial Botanical Gardens of Great Britain, where botanists and people interested in collecting plants were collecting, were collecting samples from all around the world and making botanical gardens around the world from Hong Kong to mainland China to Mauritius to other parts of the large of the British Empire. In all these instances, the ways and the approaches to knowing how to collect these plants, how to behave and how to act within a new scientific structure was also attached to considerations of race and to considerations of belonging to a particular system of belief. They definitely used local and native informers who used to help them in collecting all these samples. However, we see in many of these accounts a clear suspicion in the ability of these natives or locals to actually collect these things wisely, to collect these samples in the proper way. There is a serious difficulty that was perceived in the ability of these people to perceive the value of the knowledge that they can be entrusted with. The program of Egyptology, for instance, in the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century performed in exactly the same manner using local people and natives in order to collect samples to help the missions. However, the missions themselves and the act of producing knowledge was largely in the hands of the white colonial powers. The questions that are related to gender and the importance of gender in the production of knowledge are extremely common to the vast majority, to almost all of us, and we will talk about this in more details later in the lecture and in the discussion. Moving from the question of the knower to the question of the methods or tools of knowledge we're thinking, or the ways of knowing, we're here considering a number of traditions, of views, and of virtues that create a particular epistemic system or a system of knowledge. Epistemic virtues here represent a particular understanding of what the knower should do. What is the proper practice of knowing, and how can you instill these values of knowledge in the knower? In this view, epistemic virtues are not items on a checklist that you can check off, and they're not particular steps in a research process that you have to go through, but they are particular values that you aspire to achieve. We can think of a number of important epistemic virtues that influence this way of knowing, not only in these transitional periods like the turn of the 19th to 20th century, or in the missionary processes where we look at a particular uh, attempt at constructing a new system of knowledge, but also in our contemporary world. Let's, for instance, take an example of one of the most innovative and contemporary technologies in uh, neuromedicine. 
When we think about the functional magnetic resonance imaging or the PET, the positron emission um, tomography, we are considering two of the most important and the most developed systems of imaging that are being used in different fields of medicine and that have important implications in the production in neuroscience and in different research of neuroscience. The functional magnetic uh, resonance imaging functions in many ways, similar to the regular MRI that many of us know about. However, it also traces the flow of oxygenated blood to particular parts of the brain, for instance. And in doing so, it can actually trace or it can give us a prediction about increased activity of particular parts of the brain based on a particular form of stimulation. The importance of these or the excitement surrounding these new technologies is related to the excitement and the importance of seeing of watching things as they happen. The difference between fMRI on one hand and the regular MRI is that fMRI gives us a better idea about how things are happening, about the function. We are looking at almost real-time events that are happening inside the brain. This particular interest in seeing, in visualizing, in using the image as an important indication of proper knowing reveals an important habit and practice of knowledge that we see in our contemporary scientific and cultural practices. Seeing for yourself represents an act that is attached to the virtue of objectivity. Objectivity being a virtue, an epistemic virtue, a way of knowing, a tradition that allows us to know in the proper manner. The images of the brain that can be seen sometimes in newspapers, in magazines, or in the walls of physicians' offices become icons. In their becoming detached from their original author, in that case the patient and the machine in different capacities, and in becoming representation of a particular presence of the brain, they become in this way or they go through an act of iconization. An icon is not merely a representation of a god, a prophet, or a saint that intends to remind us of the existence of this god or prophet, but it is also an act of embodiment. It allows this prophet, god, or saint to exist again through the icon. The icon does not become just a representation of an, a being, an object, or a phenomenon that exists outside or without the icon, but it also becomes part of the being, the phenomenon that it tries to represent or that it depicts. In this same way, the image of the brain that is suddenly taken and captured in time becomes an icon of this brain. One of the earliest manifestations or representations of such imaging in popular press came in on the cover of Vogue magazine in 1986. In Vogue, there were three images of the brain taken by PAT, and we had only three words, each word attached to one of the image, normal, schizo, and depressed. The feature celebrated the idea that new imaging is now giving us the chance to actually see this abnormality in the brain as it happens. In this separation of these particular images from their larger context, in the fact that they become or they acquire huge significance while losing their very specific meaning, the fact that they on themselves would not make any sense without a larger context, without even more images that are attached to them, but at the same time become extremely significant in the representation of specific ideal types. Types that do not look like any single brain, but look like all of them at the same time. Things that we can, that our brains should aspire to be that we should emulate or become in our identification with this particular new icon. 
We can always discuss and analyze the importance of images, iconography, and representation through history, and how this kind of importance arose through different cultural, social, and scientific processes across time. That obviously included different scientific discourses, different religious discourses, political, social, and cultural discourses. What I'm getting at here, and what I started with in this lecture, is that the meaning of these particular objects and the importance and the significance of these practices of knowledge, the practices of knowing, and the practice of the knowledge itself, all these practices acquire their meaning and their importance in the larger cultural and sociocultural structure in a larger epistemic structure that is never formed by one single discipline or by one single field, but is rather formed in the interaction of different views, values, and epistemic virtues of all these fields and disciplines and ways of knowing. One of the important and probably famous experiments that were done by the fMRI is related to a trial to picture the worshiping brain. Can we capture the brain as it worships? Or can we capture the brain as it comes or it goes through a particular spiritual experiment? This series of experiments that were held by different people across time, this series of experiments led even to the development of a new field that is called neurotheology. The idea in general was not to see if an experiment happens in the brain, that point was already established. We already know that the place where we feel, we see, and have all these sorts of experiences, the physical location of these experiences is in the brain. The idea was to actually see it, look at it, locate it, find what some called the God lobe. The idea of finding this was precisely, as many of these researchers announced, was to transform the subjective nature of a particular experience into an objective, testable nature. And in doing so, we can once and for all be sure that these experiments actually happen. fMRI and PET were also used to have images of the gay brain. We can try to see whether there is a particular process that happens in the brain that makes a specific brain gay and another brain, quote unquote, straight. The results of this particular um, research appeared in the New York Times under the title Gay, Straight, or Lying. And the idea was, or the results in many, the the specific how the, the experiment was actually conducted, the sample was only composed of men. Some of them are self-proclaimed as or, and, or told the researchers that they were gay. Others um, identified themselves as bisexual and others identified themselves as heterosexual. And they were shown while being in, photographed by fMRI and their brains being photographed by fMRI, they were shown a number of pornographic images of people f belonging to different sexes and genders. And the level of excitement in their brains were being photographed. And this was correlated to a particular, to their own identification of themselves. What the experimenters found was that bisexuality almost doesn't exist, they argued. Bisexuality doesn't exist because people are either more excited, sexually excited, by the images of men or by the images of women, and never equally excited by both. It would actually be too easy to discuss the problems that are related to the sampling, for instance, the issue that all these samples or the, all the people who were put in these experiments were men, it would also be too easy to discuss the stereotypical understanding of sexual excitement and sexual desire, or the general understanding of how you can perform this particular experiment. What I want to look at here is some of the underlying logics in this particular experiment. The idea that, that runs deep in this experimental study and other studies, that there are only two sexes or two genders out there. It's in the background. 
The researchers never actually say it, but the whole premise of the experiment is that our sexual attraction and our sexual excitement is mapped along socially defined categories of sexes and genders. And therefore, we can easily trace the reality of the existence of a particular experience by trying to find the photograph of this particular reality or by creating an, an icon of this particular reality. Another important aspect in the making of a specific epistemic field is the creation of certain ways of knowing, practices of knowledge, what we can even call a ritualized performance of knowledge. Take the medical examination, for instance, as a sample of a ritualized mode of creating and practicing knowledge. From the very early stages of training of a medical student, we're also trained to go through the examination, to go through a whole jungle of sounds and feels and temperature and look for the things that we should know. Look for the specific things that would make sense in a larger epistemic structure. Similarly, the patient is also taught how to speak, how to act, how to describe their illnesses, their problems, their issues, and how to respond to an existing epistemic structure of medical knowledge. In this process, marginalization takes place as well. Marginalization of suffering based on particular diseases that cannot be understood or cannot be recognized. The frustration that many of us come through when you describe something to the physician and this thing is described as it will go by itself. It will go on, it, on its own. The existence of particular things that are largely outside the field of knowledge or the regularized or disciplined epistemic performance. There is also marginalization of pain and suffering that's related to gender and to sexuality. Pain is not the same for all genders and the experience and the expression of pain is definitely different. And the experience and expression of pain is not only dependent on a specific sex or gender, but it is also dependent on how we understand how a particular sex and gender should behave. And in this way, the expression of what comes to be or what appears to be a fundamental part of the epistemic field is regulated by the larger cultural and epistemic context that this experience takes place in. Marginalization in languages that are described in racial fashion. Can you describe your illness in clear sentences or do you use particular accents or languages that will be understood to refer to a particular socioeconomic background, for instance, or racial background? Here, the act of ritualization in its ability, a ritual being essentially a repetitive performance that acquires its authority in many ways through the repetition, but at the same time, a repetition that is never the same every time. A repetition that keeps changing and that acquires its own transhistorical authority from its ability to change and to represent not only one single meaning, but a whole host of ideas, values, and a whole spectrum of relations in each and every single iteration. The idea of this form of ritualization allows for the creation of hierarchy of knowledge that accepts particular objects as part legitimate parts of the epistemic field and rejects other parts of knowledge or other objects as things that simply do not belong within a particular epistemic field. The discussion of disciplining a field of knowledge leads us probably to a meta question about disciplining the field of or the study of science and religion in general. Do we need or should we have particular rules and ways to form what we can call a discipline of science and religion and maybe let's call it science and religion studies? The, the question underlying this question is why do we need to do so? Why would it be important to actually establish a field that would become distinguishable from other fields or other disciplines that, would we call, that, we, 
could call the studies of science and religion, for instance. Disciplining in general is not a voluntarist act. It is not an act. All the things that I was describing were not decided by a particular group of people. It is rather decided by very complex set of social reactions. When we come to discussing the issue of science and religion or the studies of science and religion and how we can picture them within or without a particular field that is very well disciplined, there is to me an important question about the value of this kind of creating or of this process of creating new disciplinary boundaries. In my view, the study of science and religion and culture exist in the intersection of the studies of science, of history, sociology, anthropology, and philosophy of science on one hand, and of the studies of religion, of its history, anthropology, sociology, and other forms of the study of religion. At the intersection of these studies, the study of science, religion, and culture is able to benefit from a very strong and developed set of methodological tools that was developed by all these disciplines. And in this particular space, there is a chance for the researcher to try to understand the larger themes of knowing, the ways through which knowledge of what we can call science and which changed its meaning several times through history and what we can call religion, which changes, changed and keep changing its meaning as well, the underlying themes that create a particular process of knowing and a particular practice of knowledge. And through this wealth of methodological innovations in these different fields, and through opening up rather than creating borders and boundaries around a particular set of studies, I believe that the study of science, religion, and culture can be extremely helpful in trying to understand these specific ways of looking at knowledge as something that, as an epistemic practice, as well as the practice of knowledge, whether in science, religion, in technology, or different other fields of our sociocultural framework. To conclude, my point from this lecture was to discuss the issue of the existence of a particular epistemic structure and that these epistemic structures exist within a certain historical contingency. The specific social, um, sociocultural and political circumstances that create a number of conditions influence the way we know and influence the way we regularize and discipline our ways of knowing. The act of disciplining a field of knowledge is important because it is able, or it is a process through which we can create a language of knowledge that can be used in order to communicate this process of knowledge and to legitimize or authorize particular epistemic practices. Without the existence of this common language that we can use to suppress particular ideas, and without the existence of methods of communication, it becomes extremely difficult to form an epistemic community. The idea that we can study science and religion by essentially taking one side over the other, or producing certain way certain polemics on science and religion is to me missing a very important opportunity, which is the ability to use the wealth of knowledge and methodological tools that we have offered by all these disciplines neighboring one another to understand in a much sub more sophisticated way how knowledge is created and how knowledge is being practiced. It becomes also an important point at understanding the different levels of marginalization, the different practices of inclusion and exclusion that are part and parcel of the production of knowledge in its various incarnations. And therefore, in my opinion, the study of science, religion, and culture, and the importance of the study of science, religion, and culture lies precisely in its ability in looking at the fundamental structures of knowing and in going across different disciplines and fields that keep changing historically and trying to understand the fundamental ways 
or the essential aspects of the practice of knowledge at any particular historical period. Thank you.